Hi, my name is Jay Reed. I'm a psychotherapist in San Francisco, California. And today I'd like to discuss developing compassion for oneself after narcissistic abuse. So today I want to describe how narcissistic abuse can often leave the survivor feeling at odds with him or herself and how we might work to cultivate a more compassionate attitude towards oneself in the surviving role. And I'd like to offer a framework to kind of help understand and promote a sense of compassion towards oneself and the ways one had to survive being the child or partner of someone who's narcissistic. So to start with, I think that the person facing narcissistic abuse suffers a, a very difficult predicament. And I'll just talk about in terms of the child and the narcissistic parent, where the child needs the same person who is treating that child very badly. You know, lots of different ways, failing to see the child for who that person is, having very little empathy for that child, and to add insult onto those sort of uh, injuries or, or injuries of omission, the commission of projecting often the narcissistic parent's own sense of worthlessness onto that child. So that's the way in which the child is being treated very badly. And then just to kind of like explain a little more about the ways in which the child needs the parent. I think there are obvious ways and that is for, you know, food, shelter, material things that the child cannot procure for him or herself. There's also maybe sort of obvious psychological necessities like having a sort of family to belong to, a place to call home, and not necessarily things are great in that home, but it just, there is a place to go to. There is an identity to be had. But another need that is so essential, and, and I think that goes both unmet and sort of exploited by the narcissistic parent, is for the child to develop a sense of his or her own identity based on how they are treated by the parent. You know, it's, it's important to uh, kind of note that children don't have an earlier frame of reference to understand the information they receive from their parents as to who they are. When you're born, your parents are your sort of first and earliest frame of reference. So as a result, there's a understandable tendency to take in as, as true how they are treated. And that can be great when the parent is uh, fairly well adjusted and accurately sees the child because they're developing a good first frame of reference for who they are. But when they're faced with a narcissistic parent, that adds or compounds to the child's problems and suffering because there isn't sort of a trustworthy and reliable other uh, way to think about and know who they are. It kind of goes back to this saying by an earlier psychoanalyst saying that, you know, it's better to live as a sinner in a world ruled by God than it is to live in a world ruled by the devil. So better to believe that the child is bad based on how the parent is treating that child than to think there's anything wrong with the parent themselves. That doesn't, that doesn't work. Uh, for the child. So the narcissistic parent, by, by their own need to relocate the sense of worthlessness they feel and finding that worthlessness in the child, ends up projecting a false but insisted upon message to the child of who that child is, married with the fact that that child is in dire need of finding out who he or she is. And it is immeasurably better to have some answer as to who the child is than to feel like nobody out there knows who the child is and, and therefore the child, him or herself, cannot figure out who he or she is. It goes back to how I mentioned before, this sort of uh, hierarchy of us all wanting a good relationship when that's available. And if not, we'll certainly settle for a bad relationship. And at all costs, we must avoid the outcome of there being no relationship. The, the experience of there being no relationship can feel like an annihilation for a child when it occurs between the child and that parent. The child cannot sort of know who he or she is. The child cannot feel like there's an other out there who also knows and is responsive to who that child is. And it's just a trauma of, you call it abandonment, uh, you call it annihilation, uh, nothingness. 
it must be avoided at all costs. So they face this sort of Faustian uh, dilemma of either feeling like they're in that void of nothingness and unknown to themselves, unknown to their parent, or feeling like they can be somebody. And that somebody, though, is one who has to suffer because that somebody is being defined as worthless by the parent. There's a falseness to it, but it still is better than the absence of any identity that the child is threatened with if he or she doesn't comply with sort of taking on the mantle of worthlessness that the narcissistic parent insists the child carry because that parent cannot face the fact that it lives in him or herself. And so kind of to delve a little bit more into the child's experience, you know, his or her actual identity in the world and I know the words are a little clumsy here as to how to describe that, but there is an actualness to how the child is. And then there's the sort of identity being offered. And, and this identity is not attuned to how the child actually is. So as a result, the child's actual way of being has to be pushed away, devalued, diminished, made not to count. And it's that sort of real self I'll, I'll use as, as, as a label that poses a threat to being able to comply with the only identity available. And this identity I'll also want to label as, say, the scapegoat uh, role, the one to blame for all of the family's problems as claimed by the narcissistic parent. The dilemma faced by the child is that when they are sort of attuned to who they actually are, their own attributes in the world, it can come along with that sense of no relationship or the sort of devastating trauma of that dysphoria of feeling unreal in the world to themselves, estranged from themselves, from, from the people seemingly closest to them, even inhuman. There's such a lack of groundedness when they attune and, and check in with who they actually are. And that state of almost like being cast into outer space and not a part of the world that they need to know, it must be avoided at all cost. And I'll call that the sort of the trauma of the nothingness that threatens the child if they don't go along with the only identity offered them, that of the scapegoat. So just laying out, in order to survive, the child has to adopt the only identity offered them. And the only identity offered them is one that is very critical of themselves. But adopting that identity is adaptive because if they didn't, there really could be this sort of psychological implosion, emotional implosion of being sort of nobody to no one. It, it, words can't convey how terrible of an outcome that is for anyone, and especially the child at that stage in their development. So I'm wanting to promote here today that there's real value in curating an attitude of appreciation for how one learned to comply with the mandates of being the scapegoat, because doing so, you know, as much suffering as it involved, saved the child from the alternative of feeling like nobody to no one. I think as, as one comes out of, a, of, of being narcissistically abused, it's often these ways one learned to comply with the only identity available to them, the scapegoat, that actually feel like the problem. That it, you know, if one finds it to feel very dangerous to entertain feelings of pride or self-worth, you know, they, one might target that sort of quote unquote, low self-worth as a problem about them. But if you take a, a say, an empathic kind of longitudinal perspective on this, it stands to great reason that one might find feelings of pride or self-worth to feel very, very dangerous, even terrifying, because such feelings before would have made the child deviate from this identity, this, again, it was false, but it was the only identity available. And being stripped of the only identity available would have threatened that child with that nothingness, with being nobody to no one. As that is appreciated by the survivor and even marveled at the kid's resilience and ability to endure in the scapegoat role in order to have an identity that saved them and the survivor too from uh, that possible sort of uh, terrible outcome, 
the parts of the child that learn to cope with the scapegoat role get to be seen actually and over time kind of brought back into connection with and integrated with uh, the survivor's entire self. A harmony can kind of develop where importantly that threat of the nothingness gets to, you know, the, the survivor gets to know that is no longer in play. And I'll say it, there's often the fear that that nothingness could arise if the scapegoat world is not complied with. But once one has reached adult maturity and is psychologically intact, it's only a fear. The nothingness will not reassert itself the way it did for the child in this terrible position. Yet it can remain a grave fear in a sort of post-traumatic way. And that shift of appreciation for the ways one learned to cope with the role of, of, of being the scapegoat in order to survive and avoid falling into sort of the nothingness um, which could have otherwise developed, I think is, the, is at the heart a very compassionate one um, towards the various aspects to oneself. So let's say, for instance, that one learned to be incredibly attentive and even appeasing to say the narcissistic parent who treated the child very poorly. Well, that itself is a way of complying with uh, this identity of scapegoat that say the child was worthless and didn't deserve more. And there's actually some merit in that for the child. So learning to enact an appeasing attitude towards the, the parent who's treating that child poorly created a lot of suffering, but it helped the child remain in that identity and then get to a point later in life where they could entertain other alternatives. And as more compassion can be harnessed for the way one learned to kind of adopt this tactic of appeasement, that over time can be very helpful in bringing this part of the self back sort of into the kind of collective harmony of the survivor's entire self. You know, and this can be a hard and sometimes slow process because the feelings that are associated with different with the different ways of complying with the scapegoat role can be so strong and so difficult. I mean, particularly feelings of strong humiliation that were likely there and had to be endured. And sometimes just bringing up the ways one learned to cope by, say, appeasing the narcissistic person can feel so even humiliating in the here and now that it kind of can create a shutdown or need to kind of turn away. But over time, as this is stuck with, uh, the intensity of those feelings diminishes and this appreciation gets to more come to the fore and that the part of the, the survivor that, that learned to appease gets to be met in this way and ultimately welcomed. And that may seem like a, a, a far out notion but it's just to say that if it's stuck with and, you know, efforts are made to kind of stay in contact with these different parts and compassion cultivated, it very much can occur. Again, so a few tactical ways to do that. It, it comes back to keeping one's nervous system from getting too high and too low. And all the exercises that we've talked about in past videos, such as attending to the breath, inhaling through the nose and exhaling through the nose, there's also somatic exercises that help to kind of convey to the nervous system that there's a way to feel safety within the body. And there's a, two exercises that a man named Peter Levine has shown on YouTube, and I encourage folks to uh, watch his videos, to learn ways of offering the body experiences of safety. They are ones to be practiced and utilized over time, but are a real important, I think, augmentation to this work in the recovery from narcissistic abuse. And one that I think can be particularly useful is to take the right hand and sort of soften the fingers, place it under the left armpit, and place your left hand over your right shoulder. And just noticing your breath in this stance over uh, some moments, three to five minutes, um, can be very useful. And it may take time to just practice for this to feel comfortable, but I think it's well worth that effort. It's very aligned too with this uh, notion of developing compassion and safety and connection with oneself 
in, in recovery here. Well, thank you for watching today's video. And again, thank you for your continued support and engagement with this channel and with each other. The comments are just so heartening to read each week in, in, in responses and support that commenters are offering one another. I look forward to posting again next week, Sundays at 9 a.m. And I hope everyone takes good care.